his perspective is one of tragedy, one of hubris, and also a little bit of humor, right? Now think about it like this. You are Cecil B. Heimerdinger, professor of Piltover University. And yes, that is his actual name. You are a founding member of Piltover. You are quite literally the oldest thing in Piltover. You are a yordle. Therefore, you are, by human standards, essentially immortal. I think that humans seem to kind of not understand that well. All you've ever wanted is Piltover to be a free land under your guiding principles and under your life's passion, which is scientific exploration. You also share this land with humans, a strangely compelling and passionate and wonderful race that has the potential for insane highs, but also really bad lows. So when one of your brightest and youngest and freshest faces of the university is thrown in prison for literally blowing up a house, you know it's your duty and your obligation to go and make sure that this doesn't lead to potential problems. So you start with an off-the-cuff remark about how imprisonment is strange because the mind is still free while the body is chained. And in your mind that is true because you think of the mind as everything a a being is, you are the mind. And if your mind is free then you are never really trapped. But also you do this because, you know, it comes across as kind of eccentric and humans respond really well to an eccentric little yordle rather than a serious brooding and kind of sad or depressed yordle. So over the years you've learned that being eccentric and quirky very much disarms and makes humans feel a little bit more at ease. And also after 300 years you've kind of just become eccentric in your own right. And after a little back and forth he tells you, oh, I've been experimenting with magic. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. Oh, oh no. I was kind of hoping it was nuclear bombs and not magic. And but you can't react too strongly. So you you keep your reaction as 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 calm and as as measured as it can be when you're discussing literal planet destroying problems. So you tell him, "Hey man, you can't be messing around with this stuff because it will lead to the destruction of a civilization or two. And he's like, "But it's going to revolutionize everything." What do you mean? I'm going to we're going to be fine. No, magic is too dangerous, and humans are too corruptible, you guys are all like little babies on and you literally cannot help yourselves when they're in front of you. You have no self-restraint, you've got nothing going, but anyway, you, you don't tell them that, this is just what you're thinking. The power of magic is just too alluring for the regular person, so you have to try and encourage them not to do it, but you don't want him to get punished too severely because he's just a sweet kid he's just doing what he thinks is right and he's not doing it out of malice he's not doing it for power he's doing it because he wants to help Piltover and you respect that and so you, like, just don't mention the magic stuff and you'll be fine and he's like, all right yeah okay that's fine so you toddle off and await Jace's trial and you go and do your professor business and when that happens you and the counselors and a whole jury congregate and you watch this young man come forward but you're sure that Jace will do the right thing and do what is told because even though he might be a man of progress he is still surely rational and he is very much the equal to your assistant Victor and you when you watch him drag himself to the center of the room and he's looking all dejected and then he opens his mouth and say I'm sorry I I, I, I messed up I did the wrong things and I'm, I'm I don't want to cause problems and you're like oh thank god he didn't mention any magic stuff jesus christ man and you're almost dying of relief but everyone around the table is like saying so we're going to expect you to blow up buildings as your contribution to our city and you're like hey that's just science man you can't do science without breaking a few wrenches <laughs> and you know after all science is a messy subject and sometimes it's a little bit more experimental than methodical but then the noxon lady starts her questions and you're like oh she is poking at him and you are very viscerally reminded of the fallibility of man and that is that no matter how kind no matter how sweet no matter how thoughtful and intelligent or rational they might be they all have one undeniable flaw they all have an ego and he starts his outburst about his revolutionary studies into magic and when the whole room goes silent you think, oh, well, he's gone now. He's he, he's removed from this. He's he's broken the ethos. His banishment is going to be now solidified. And when Balbok, the clock guy, is like, ah, yes, my race was destroyed by this. You're like, okay, well, I tried, Jace. But then 
something interesting happens. People were kind of receptive to the idea. Even though Bulbuck literally just said that his entire race was destroyed by this stuff, everyone's like, oh, did we not try this before? Did we not try to make magic work? So you explain to them, look, this is a really bad idea. Don't do this. Just don't. People might think that you're too safe or too cautious or too whatever, but you have the experience. You've seen firsthand what a mage with untapped power can do. Now, Imagine that in Piltover. If that guy on the council who looks a bit like that bard from Bilgewater, what was his name? David Bowie is anything to go by? They would take a sliver of power and run with it. And I mean, they need to see it from your perspective. There are literally nations that have built fortresses out of stuff that prevents magic. And Piltover is not too dissimilar. So people agree with you. The Arcane is just too great of a temptation for regular humans and they start to basically talk about Jace's banishment. And you still think, no, he's still a good kid, man. Like, he, he just messed up. He, did, he just did the wrong thing. So you advocate for a lenient sentence. Banishment is just too severe. Of course, after the, the whole trial, it's your duty to go and ensure that Jace's research never sees the light of day. So you go with your assistant, Victor, who is brilliant, he is amazing, and you guys are talking about it. You know, he's an inquisitive mind. So when he's like, hey, do you think you could do this? You don't think of it as like him thinking it's something we should pursue. You just think of it as him being naturally curious because he is a scientist. And you're like, I'm not going to delve into magic. That is the worst idea in the world. And he's like, okay, fair enough, bro. Don't worry, Victor. By tomorrow, all of this magic stuff will be long behind us. So you go home and you get ready for sleep and you think to yourself, oh, thank God that that problem is over. So imagine your surprise when some enforcers come in and say, hey, um, someone's in the room with all the magic stuff. And you're like, you're kidding me, right? You're absolutely joking. No, that there is actually someone in the magic room. So you run and charge, you, you scamper there as really fast as your little legs can carry you. And the door's barricaded, but you can kind of hear some commotion on the inside and you can make out two voices. It is Jason Victor. So you try and bang on the door. You try and plead with them not to do this. And then the door blows in on itself and you walk in and you find not two charred remains of young lads. You find two boys floating in the sky and you think, oh, you've actually done it. And so you think it's appropriate to quote your favorite movie, Ixtel Park. Just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. But you're also a smart yodel. You know what this means. The box is opened and it will never go back in. You try to reason with them, but then that baddie from Noxus comes in and she's like, ha ha, we have the tool that we've been looking for. And you're like, oh. <sighs> you know in your heart of hearts, this Hextech business will lead to nothing good. But you also know that at least if you're there and you are the guiding hand, that maybe it can be managed. Fast forward a few years, and to your surprise, and no small amount of chagrin, this Hextech malarkey has actually brought around a, a, an era of prosperity for Piltover. You have instantaneous travel to far corners of the world, and this has all surpassed air travel, which in itself was the most revolutionary thing to ever happen to the entirety of Runeterra. As a show of good faith and a little bit of humility, you suggest to Jace that maybe he should do the speech for the progress day. After looking at the statue of the guy that helped you found Piltover, although you might have some personal grievances, you kind of realize that actually, sometimes you have to sacrifice what you think is right for the greater prosperity. And you think that after so many years, you finally have a protege worth rolling the dice on. And it's no small amount of irony that it's from magic of all things. So Jace invites you to see the next chapter of Hextech as he calls it, because you know, for his progress day speech, you think, hey, how about a demonstration? But this is also a good opportunity so you can have a little sneak preview if they're doing anything that they shouldn't be doing. And in earnest, these things are great. They are fantastic inventions, but you try to encourage them to take it a bit slower because you know, it's one thing to have hexed gates that can transport trade around the world, which you can carefully regulate and have official station to operate, compared to giving regular people gauntlets that can crush people's skulls or laser beams that could cut people in half. It's a, a bit of a leap, but you say to them, hey, let's give it a couple of decades. Like, I know humans don't understand this time thing like you do. They always think of it as days, weeks, and months, when they should be thinking about it as weeks, months, and years. So when Jace's 
speech does happen. And when he falters on stage, you're just like, oh no, Jace, man, don't do it. But to your relief, he doesn't. Instead, he just gives a fantastic speech. And you think he's still a good boy. He's still great. He's still the, the man worthy of being the man of progress. He still has a kind heart. He's still trying to do what's right. And I, I respect that because ultimately, those little gems, those magic gems in the wrong hands is the scariest thing you could possibly imagine. And especially if they're in the hands of someone from the Undercity. Well, next day you find out that exact scenario actually happens. Someone from the Undercity came up and stole these gems. And this is the worst possibility because you know that the Undercity population, they don't have any morals. They only think about how they can profit and how they can win. So you guys hold this emergency meeting and Jace fully accepts responsibility for his actions in what just happened. And he starts as you say things like, I think we should completely suspend all Hextech operations and even the Hex gates. And you think, wow, this kid really would sacrifice his life's work for the preservation of the city. And you are you are reminded that he's a good kid. He just wants to do what's right, even if it means that he sacrifices himself. So when that old Noxus lady was like, hey, why don't we promote Jace to being a counselor? It's a hard choice, but you think it's for the best because you think Jace is still good enough to protect Hextech from itself. So things slowly tick over and you go back to tinkering and inventing until the day that you find out that Victor is dying and that breaks your heart. Victor is a good kid. He's a he's a fantastic scientist, a fantastic inventor. But but this is the reality of the world. People die and you accept this. You have lived 10 times the average life expectancy of someone down in the Undercity. And this is the nature of life. This is the nature of your life. But this school comes to a head when your two most promising students, the two men that you hitched your bets on the prosperity and the future of Piltover, turn up with the very thing that you swore to destroy. Magic so potent that it could destroy civilizations. And you tell them it must be destroyed, it needs to be destroyed. But this is when you are also reminded that even though humans have an ego, there is one thing that they will place above all else and that is their fear of death. And you worry that Victor's prognosis has led them both down a dark path because Victor now is all about survival and Jace will do whatever it takes to ensure that Victor doesn't die because he sees him like a brother. And while you love, respect and cherish Victor as your student and as your assistant, his one life is not worth endangering the lives of the entirety of Piltover. So you take a firm stance against the two of them and you tell them, hey, this needs to be destroyed and I'm going to destroy it. All pretense of eccentricity has been absolved. You are now serious and you will stop at nothing to ensure that Piltover will not be destroyed. So that day you come to another council meeting and you tell them all that you think that now is the time that we all come together. Now is the time that we all do what's right for Piltover. I actually start to think about our future. But you are interrupted by Jace who tells you, hey, maybe it's time you got retired. You turned a blind eye to these people that live below you and now they are a problem that he needs to deal with. And you think that can't be true. And you are completely taken aback because you know, you, you're 300 years old, sure, but you're not retirement age, what the hell? But you then figure out it's because you want to prevent magic from being studied. You want to prevent Hextech from being a factor in Piltover. So you try and fight your cause, but unanimously the council decides to oust you and you are heartbroken because the man of progress, the student that you took under your wing, that you propped up to make sure that they were the best that they possibly could be, so they had all the resources they could possibly use to succeed has now gone against you and betrayed you and you realize this is just a human trait when they have something new and exciting it gives them what they want they will make sure that never gets removed but what can you do this is what you decided as a founding element of your city you can't go against it otherwise you'll be labeled as a hypocrite forever so you just have to accept that reality so what do you do now for the first time in hundreds of years, you have no plan, you have no goal, you have no direction in life. Now, without having to worry about the university or Piltover, you can go and see if what he said about the Undercity is true. In response to all the commotion, Jace blockaded the city. And so using your Yordle stealth ability, you you run down into the Undercity and you, you take a look around. While you sat in your ivory tower and saw prosperity flourish around you in the City of Progress, you are reminded that deep down, out of sight, 
out of mind. There are people suffering. There are people fighting. There are children starving who are rummaging around bins to find food. And there are people down here living in the dumps and living the worst life you could possibly imagine. And this all happened because you turned a blind eye, unwilling to challenge the status quo, and you let this fester. Maybe you are the proud one. Maybe you are the reason why this is all happening. Maybe you are the one with the ego, blindly following what you believe is right. And now you see that what you've done is wrong. And now you want to give back, but they don't want your help. They don't need your help. They are almost happy to live like this. And your heart breaks again. You have really become a waste of space. Even these people that so desperately look like they need your help refuse it. So what, what is next for you? Then you decide, maybe I should leave. Maybe I should leave the country. And as you prepare to embark on a boat, a bright light catches your eye. And you walk over there to find a hoverboard. Sat there and you're thinking, huh, how curious. What a fantastically built machine. This thing is wonderful. What an invention. But then you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem like it's appropriately pitched when some kid just goes, haha, you're wrong. And then he explains that the air is denser down in the undercity, so they're pitched properly for that. And you're like, oh. You turn around and you're like, oh. Oh boy, he's got a broken leg. So maybe you think you can help him. And in a remarkable twist of fate, you feel that you can be useful one more time. So you take the boy back to his home, a oasis in this undercity, a beautiful tree, a small community of people living happily, living peacefully, living in prosperity. And they're thriving and you can't believe it. How could they do this? This boy is so young. How could he create something so fantastic? so spectacular in such a short period of time and for the first time in 300 years and despite what you hold and what you believe to be true you find out that real progress isn't science it isn't just doing what you think is right it's not even giving people technology it's giving people the tools and the ability to live a good life i just want to give my gratitude to my members especially lavender yuri and alan now, if you like this video, please give it a like and please let me know in the comments what you think is the greatest theory or what you, what you enjoyed about season one.